Okay, well, it's high noon, and I think we'll get started. Welcome to the briefing on the outcomes of the very recent Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's quite a mouthful, but uh, in short, we're just going to refer to it as the COP28. And I'm Margaret Williams. I will be your host today. I'm calling in from the Harvard Kennedy School, where I am a senior fellow at the Arctic Initiative. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. We have a wonderful panel, and I'll introduce them briefly. I just wanted to first say a quick uh, few words about the Arctic Initiative here at the Kennedy School. We're actually part of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. And we have uh, three major initiatives. We uh, work to improve understanding of the re regional and global impacts of climate change in the far north. Uh, we're working with regional, local, and national stakeholders to develop uh, informed res and responsive policies and practices. And we're also working to train future generations of interdisciplinary Arctic experts and leaders. And so I'm really thrilled to be part of this team at the uh, Arctic Initiative. Now on to our panel. We have a, a crackerjack panel full of uh, amazing experts who are coming fresh from Dubai, having experienced this incredible event. And uh, you can read more about all their biographies on the website where you registered, but I'll give you a quick overview of who we have. And I'm gonna start with Vicki Lee Walgren. Vicki is the director of the World Wildlife Fund Global Arctic Program. She is uh, leading a team of experts on all things Arctic, uh, biodiversity, governance, climate science, and stakeholder engagement. And Vicki has uh, lots of experience working in conservation issues around the globe. And it's uh, really wonderful to see you, Vicki. I also wanted to add that uh, World Wildlife Fund, which Vicki and Martin represent, uh, has played an incredibly important role in the Arctic. And WWF has uh, observer status on the Arctic Council and is a player on many global forums. And so we're, um, I'm really thrilled to have two colleagues a longtime friends and colleagues from World Wildlife Fund. We also have Sarah Osvig from the International, uh, from the Inuit Circumpolar Council, where Sarah is the international chair. And uh, we also refer to the international, the Inuit Circumpolar Council as ICC. And ICC has been a critical player in representing indigenous peoples across the Arctic. ICC is a permanent participant of the Arctic Council. So uh, it's really been an influential. Uh, voice in Arctic policy throughout the uh, last last decades. And Sarah um, comes to us with incredible experience as a member of the Parliament of Denmark, Parliament of Greenland. She's currently the uh, a member of the Human Rights Council of Greenland. And uh, she's also an advisory, one of the advisory council members to my program here at Harvard. So it's wonderful to see Sarah again. We also have Dr. Martin Summercorn, who is the head of conservation for World Wildlife Fund's Global Arctic Program. Martin integrates science uh, into nature conservation efforts, resilience building and governance. He's also an old friend, so it's wonderful to see you, Martin, uh, calling in from Norway. And um, finally, we have Dr. Sue Natali, who is a senior science at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. And she leads uh, an incredible team at Woodwell of people working on uh, carbon cycling, research on permafrost, wildfires, and um, related Arctic issues. So Dr. Sunatali, welcome to you. And thank you all again so much for joining. We have a huge uh, audience. It's wonderful to see the interest in the Arctic. I think over 200 people uh, called in. So that's really exciting. And we're gonna have a couple of rounds of questions. I'm gonna ask you all uh, the same question for our first round. And then we'll go into some more specific Arctic questions for each of you. And then there'll be time for our audience to ask you questions or maybe share some commentaries. And before I go into your, um, I'd like to hear your opinion on what you think the overall uh, outcome was or how successful do you think this COP was? And clearly there were, there were huge expectations going into this meeting and coming out of it. Uh, one of the opinion pieces I read in the New York Times said, uh, there were just two little words. They appear, they appear on just one page of an 11,000 word document. The inclusion of the phrase fossil fuels in the final agreement from COP 
marks a potentially trajectory altering moment in the fight against climate change. So I'd love to hear from you. Was this indeed a real turning point uh, for the planet, also for the Arctic? Uh, and how generally do you feel about it? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, what were your overall all thoughts about the, about the COP? And again, we will go into Arctic specific questions afterward. But Vicky, I'd love to start with you and your opinion on how things went in Dubai. Oh, Margaret, that's a tough one. It's hard to say uh, anything without putting a qualifier behind it, I think. That's okay. <laughs> um, like you're saying, I mean, my goodness, it took 20 years to finally get fossil fuels acknowledged in the COPs. So yes, that's definitely an important step. And it's an important one to try to get it into that trajectory. But, you know, let's be honest, it's overall, it's, it's still too weak. Uh, it's still moving too slowly. And there are still too many loopholes in the text. Okay, great. I'm not great, but great. You're very succinct. Thank you for that. Sarah, what are your thoughts on the overall situation coming out of the cup? Yes, I think that uh, seen from an indigenous people's perspective, there were definitely some some important um, achievements uh, from, from the Global Indigenous Peoples Caucus uh, this year, things that we missed at last year's COP, COP27 in the outcome documents. But as we said from the Inuit Circular Council, this was a transitional COP so to speak, not transformational, not transformative in the way that we had wished it would be. Uh, but uh, in terms of including the rights of indigenous peoples and human rights in general, there were some uh, improvements that we were, of course, uh, happy to see. Excellent. Well, that's encouraging. Martin, you've been to uh, quite a few cops before. How do you think this one went? Yeah, and I pick you up on that one, Margaret, because uh, it's important that we see the COPs as a as a whole process, uh, and and so looking at one particular COP is only telling uh, some aspects of the story. But this one was an important one because it was the first common uh, process to actually uh, deliver a major course correction uh, for our actions on. Um, on climate change, especially on on, on mitigation and uh, the reduction of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, <clears throat> with a global stocktake process. This was the global stocktake process COP, and it failed to deliver. Um, and I say that from an Arctic perspective, um, because it failed to deliver the necessary short-term steps that are needed to keep um, the global warming below 1.5 degrees. It made progress, but it didn't deliver the 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 the, the short term action and the um, and created a lot of loopholes uh, in order to uh, that would be necessary to actually save an Arctic as we as we would recognize it. So overall, it's it's a thumbs down, um, but it is important to look into context. It took and and take that with the uh, grain of of salt that uh, I speak with now. It took only twenty eight years to get the world fossil fuels into uh, an outcome document for a COP. Yikes! That's sobering, but uh, very important. And Martin, um, before we go on to Sue for her her overall assessment. I know there are many people on this call who are very informed about the COP, but could you just tell the audience in brief, what does it mean to have a global uh, stock take, just so that people understand that that what that was all about? Martin, if you could- Oh, that was to me. I thought it was to yes. Sue. Yes. Yeah, yeah sorry. <clears throat> so the global stock take was basically a process that was a common process. Um, that looked at the state of the planet against the uh, nationally determined contribution. Each party to the to the UNFCCC actually comes with their individual nationally co determined contribution to reach the common uh, target of Paris to limit warming to two degrees, to well below two degrees, um, with efforts to pursue 1.5 degrees of global warming. And this was basically the first common process to look into where we are on that road commonly, uh, put everything into uh, one report uh, on on the synthesis report uh, issued by the UNFCCC and look what actually needs to get done in order to, to deliver that course correction that has been hailed uh, also at the COP um, as a North Star for, for 1.5 or off 1.5 degrees. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, now, Sue, over to you. What were your uh, assessments 
or what is your assessment of uh, coming out of the COP? And I know you've been to these before, uh, but fresh from Dubai, yeah. what is your thought? So like saying like, thumbs up or thumbs down is really difficult to say because it's very subjective, right? It's like my stand, if my stand, if my expectations are really low, then I may say thumbs up. But I think I agree with the other panelists on a, on a couple of things. Um, first of all, like it's tricky to say any one cop is a turning point, right? Because if we have our expectations that these cops, like some magic is going to happen, and then we're going to, you know, in the, and we're going to like have this pathway forward and and actions to, um, you know, much higher ambition to reduce fossil fuel emissions, I think I think then it's always going to be a thumbs down. It's always going to be a disappointment because this is a process and it's a process for the people who are in the room, but also it's a process that includes many, 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 many people who are not in the room and people who have been like acting and pushing tirelessly to move things forward from all sectors of society. So I think that's really like, I never have an expectation that a cop will be a turning point. Um, and then I think Martin mentioned this being an opportunity for a course correction. And when I, I agree with you, when you think about that, no, it wasn't a course correction. And, and there, you know, there were some things that were nice to see. So, you know, operationalization of loss and damage on day one, great, but of course not enough funds there. Um, and then also some other issues there. But I think just in terms of commitments for fossil fuel reductions and, and whether this was a, a, a course correction, I mean, I, how do we, like, how can I celebrate the fact that the words fossil fuels were in there? Like, that's like, oh my gosh, if I'm celebrating that, then that then my standards are really, really low. And also the language was to transition away from fossil fuels to achieve net zero by 2050. And the last IPCC report and the latest science, like we're not gonna stay below 1.5. We have to be transitioning to net zero much, much sooner before 2050 if we actually wanna stay to 1.5. And so I'd say that what came out of this COP isn't even aligning with the science that was in the last IPCC report. And so um, I'd say, yes, some, some some pluses, but um, it, it's not it's not aligning with the science, and it's not aligning with, with people's um, impacts and observations. Okay, again, a sobering assessment. And and Sue, um, you mentioned uh, one of the the key scientific reports that informs this process. I'm just for the audience. I'm just going to. Um, tell them that IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And again, I, I think most of our, our audience is very well informed about the Arctic, but some people might be new. So I just wanted to bring that up. And would you be willing just to summarize, um, as Martin did, uh, the meaning of loss and damage that was going into the COP, that was a that was a big focus of this uh, convention, just as Martin summarized the global stock taking. Could you just tell our audience about what that is? Yeah, I'm not a loss and damage expert. I'm, there are probably others on this panel who are much more uh, have expertise in this. But I mean, climate change is happening. People are being impacted. There, there, there's losses to lands. There's losses to livelihoods. Um, and so, how do we? Part of adapting and building resilience, um, recognizing that climate change has already happened, will continue to happen, is this idea of loss and damage and support. The loss and damage fund. Um, had been limited or is limited primarily to countries in the global south and rightfully so right the people who have contributed the least and are impacted the most to climate change i will just want to point out and and, and sarah could probably comment on this also because i think the icc had put forward statements about the need for um, indigenous peoples in the north who are being impacted have been impacted for decades by climate change are literally losing land um, and thinking about financial support for for um, communities and peoples who are not part of this loss and damage framework. Okay, excellent. And before we go on to our second round of uh, Arctic specific questions, Sarah, just on that topic of uh, loss and damage to inform our listeners, would you like to add anything more to that uh, definition? Yes, since last year's COP, COP27, the Global Indigenous Peoples Caucus, so from all seven socio-cultural regions that Indigenous peoples work within in a UN framework, uh, agreed to push for for the climate finance mechanisms, including the loss and damage fund, to be open and directly accessible to all indigenous peoples from all regions, because as it was just said, uh, they are built uh, by default to flow from north to south and from so-called developed to developing countries. 
And together with other indigenous peoples from around the world, we are calling for an end to the false dichotomy of developed and developing exactly because indigenous peoples from all over the world uh, have been impacted the most by climate change. And we are not the only ones, us from the Arctic, that can't access the uh, uh, loss and damage fund as it is being built now. Uh, first of all, you have to go through a filter of a government. And in many places around the world, indigenous peoples are not even recognized by their governments. And second of all, when it flows in a way and it's built in a way that goes from developed to developing or from global north to global south, then you're leaving out uh, regions of the world that don't fall under the developing category or global south category. So that's a big issue that we will continue working on, uh, not only from Arctic indigenous peoples, but the whole global caucus is uh, agreeing on this uh, because it is a, an inequity that we think is a uh, uh, has to be corrected. Okay, excellent. Very helpful. And just for people to understand that th this uh, part of uh, the COP and the issue of, of finance, um, climate finance for people in experiencing these um, severe impacts. Um, well, thank you for that first round. It's a not quite a mixed bag, mostly, uh, I would say, <laughs> not a not great um, assessment, but some encouraging encouraging developments. Now I'd like to go on to Arctic specific questions and we're gonna start with um, Vicki Lee Walgren, again, Director of World Wildlife Fund's uh, Global Arctic Program. I believe Vicky's joining us from Sweden. And um, Vicky, I wanted to ask you again, World Wildlife Fund has been such an influential player in Arctic issues. Uh, going into the COP, could you tell us about uh, what were WWF's goals uh, specifically for the Arctic and uh, how do you think it went for the Arctic? How was the Arctic represented at the at the convention? Thanks, Margaret. Um, so yeah, what were our what were our big goals um, towards this COP in Dubai? Um, obviously, the the first and the biggest one was around the global stock take um, that Martin talked about earlier, um, and wanting to have a strong text in that global stock take which would help pave the way towards stronger nationally determined contributions um, to help uh, exactly as, as was said before, correct that course towards one and a half degrees. Um, and I mean, this one and a half degrees is such a key precondition for any Arctic conservation work. Um, it's the biggest goal that we have for this COP and for all of the COPs, of course. Um, and I won't get into details on this um, and, and the details of the implications of, of what the outcomes were. I know that Martin will be getting into this one a bit more, but um, you were mentioning earlier on about that article um, and how I was talking about those two words that came out um, <laughs> um, in that same document, excuse me just a second. In that same document, I note that the word cryosphere uh, in, the, in, in the global stock take appears all of once. Um, you know, and that's also quite telling, right? I mean, talking about the importance, the significance of cryosphere changes to, to the world um, as a whole, you know, it gets acknowledged one time throughout that entire document as well. So, I mean, obviously we're, we're, we're quite disappointed um, by, by the, overall top, top, the overall text in the global stock take. Um, as I said earlier, I mean, it's just, it's all around, it, it, it's too weak. Um, there are far too many loopholes um, in there. Uh, and this will be the basis, hopefully, you know, informed by this global stock take document, uh, informed by IPCC science to, for all countries to develop their nationally determined contributions over the coming years. It, you know, this is really going to be that critical test to see how they take this forward. There's a lot of wording in there that opens up for people to have big ambitions. There's a lot of good words that are in there, but again, in terms of the must-haves, uh, it's altogether too weak. And there's there's a lot of opportunity for um, actors to essentially continue with business as usual as well. Um, and we simply cannot afford that. So that was the first one, um, sadly disappointing. Uh, the second big goal that we were uh, working towards was a decision to phase out fossil fuels um, by 2050 um, and a complete phase out uh, in the Arctic as well. 
Um, again, as was already mentioned earlier, we did finally get an acknowledgement of fossil fuels as the, the culprit to climate change for the first time in 28 years, which again is, you know, it's, it's shocking that it would have taken that long, but yes, good to see it finally in that text. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tragic that it's taken such a long time um, to get there. Um, at the COP, um, WWF and the Global Arctic Program, we actually released a research brief that we had written um, looking at oil and gas trends productions. Um, and this, you know, around the same time as, as the um, uh, production gap report as well. And what you can see in the production gap report is how uh, oil and gas production will peak at around 2030 and then decrease and always too slowly compared to the, the trends that we would need to be able to reach the one and a half degree targets. What we see in the Arctic, however, is how peak does not come until about 10 years later. Mm. Globally, what you see in that trend is that by 2030, that trend is already still, you know, about two times higher than what we need to have for the one and a half degrees target. If we look at the Arctic and that peak at 2040, by that point, it's about seven times above where the world will need to be by 2040. So, you know, I mean, the need for this is just, you know, incredible um, and unbelievable. And, and that, that, that paradox, of course, with the Arctic warming four times faster than the rest of the world, where the effects are so, you know, so critical. Um, and at the same time, seeing one of the culprits with oil and gas um, production happening so much up in, the, up in this region as well. Um, so these dynamics is, is, is really, uh, it's, it's very clear and it's very contradictory as we see uh, in the Arctic. Um, and again, not getting as far as we need to be um, after this, this COP. Um, another area that's been really strong uh, and important for us and, and hoping to see at this COP uh, is that connection between climate and nature. Um, tomorrow is actually the the, the one year anniversary, you could say, after the Kunming uh, Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, we really need to see how these two are coming together and how countries are able to integrate their actions and responses to this, this dual crisis of climate and biodiversity. Um, and we are happy to see that there was some explicit mention of the Global Biodiversity Framework in the Global Stock Take text. Uh, there was a uh, a statement, a shared statement between the presidencies of the UNFCCC's COP28 presidency and COP15 presidency um, from the, the um, biodiversity framework. Uh, so, you know, there's talk towards that. Um, and once again, it's really going to be up to everybody to see where what the next steps are. Countries as they develop their, you know, their nationally determined contributions, but similarly, their um, national biodiversity strategies and action plans and seeing how these two talk to each other um, and how they can be working and, and, and finding those synergies together. Um, not wanting to take up too much time here, Margaret, I know it was only supposed to be up five minutes, so I think I'll round it up here. Wow, well, that's excellent. And gosh, so much, uh, yeah, so much material there that you just shared with us. Just working backwards, I just wanted to to uh, share with our audience. Uh, you mentioned the Global Biodiversity Framework. Uh, tomorrow will be the year anniversary of the last uh, meeting of that convention, and one of the big um, recommendations coming out of that or agreements was for the the over a hundred countries or 190 think, countries that signed on to that agreed to uh, set aside 30 percent of lands and waters uh, by 2030 in in some kind of conservation status. And so that's um, that that was a good piece of good news. And again, uh, we're having a massive global biodiversity um, crisis as we lose species around the world um, to many human caused impacts and climate change is, is one of those. So that was good that um, to see the that you're describing there was a connection and recognition of that. And um, so many more things to comment on. Maybe at some point we can come back to some of the loopholes that you mentioned, if those are that might be a, of interest to the audience. And um, and then the phasing out of fossil fuels and and the fact that the Arctic is going to be is is going to keep um, peaking in terms of production is what you're saying um, ten years after the rest of the world peaks, and that is um, of course pretty 
beyond beyond concerning, uh, considering that the Arctic is not only feeling the impacts of climate change um, so so distinctly, but also what happens in the Arctic is is impacting uh, so many other parts of the world, and it's um, it's all all connected. <laughs> but um, thank you for that. And I'm going to go on next to Sarah to give her uh, the floor. And Sarah, I'd like to ask you, um, you mentioned it a little bit already, but um, how was the Inuit community represented? And, and more generally, how were Indigenous peoples represented at the COP? And in terms of the Arctic, um, what do you think some of the key takeaways were for Arctic peoples? Well, first of all, I just want to say that we, as an organization, an Indigenous Peoples Organization, we also work on climate change uh, issues throughout the year and prepare our COP attendance uh, throughout the year. Uh, we have had uh, delegations uh, there and, and our leaders, Inuit leaders, have been there since 1992 Rio summit uh, and have been uh, part of establishing the UNFCCC framework. Uh, so it is uh, a given for us to go to the COPs and depending on our funding and our capacity, we, we go with a smaller or a bigger delegation. And this year we had a, a big delegation, the biggest so far, as far as we know, with six youth and also knowledge holders that came with us after having gathered with other knowledge holders from across the Arctic at the UNFCC Framework Facilitative Working Group. Arctic regional gathering that was held in uh, Sapmi, in the land of the Sami people earlier this year. Uh, so we were able to go with both leaders and staff, uh, youth and knowledge holders, and older, also uh, an elder came with us like last year. So we had a relatively big delegation at this COP, but more importantly, we have been working throughout the year to formulate our position paper for this COP building on the gatherings that we've held throughout the year. Of course, the uh, Arctic Regional Gathering in October in Sapmi, but also our Arctic People's Conference that was held in July. And there has been a, a few things that have been sort of top of our minds to address uh, throughout the year. For example, uh, that uh, what the world calls just transition is not always just for indigenous peoples. So in our position paper for the COP, we also offered our own definition of just transition, as well as of the term green colonialism, which we see just transition risking to become if we are not careful about justice for whom, you know, talking about justice for whom when we talk about just transi transition. But in our position paper, we also had five distinct um, goals uh, that we brought with us to this COP. Uh, but first of all, I just want to say that going into the COP, when I traveled from, from, from Nuuk to going to Dubai, uh, our media was full of news about uh, in, in northern Greenland not having access to hunting this year at this time of year, resulting in 205 children being at risk, according to the child rights spokesperson in Greenland. And therefore, for us, it is just very, very real. You know, climate change is so real, it's directly affecting our families. At the same time, this year has also uh, been very uh, unusual in South Greenland uh, with droughts uh, in the summer and with a much more heavy snowfall in the fall than we have seen at a different time of year, resulting in a lot of the sheep farmers being... Um, you know, deeply impacted because their sheep were covered in snow and, and there had to be a massive uh, rescue um, uh, initiatives conducted to save as many as the, of the sheep as possible. And our dog sledding teams in North and families that still um, live with dog sledding as a means of transportation for hunting and, and, and other things have really been struggling because of the lack of access to hunting and therefore not being able to hunt food for the dogs and being left with the only opportunity of buying store-bought food for the dogs, affecting their econ economies massively. So for families here in Greenland and across Inuit Nunat, uh, climate change continues to be a very real thing that affects us in so many different ways. 
Uh, and, and in spite of that, we see that many of these outcome documents do not distinctly recognize our rights as indigenous peoples and do not uh, also have not every year been very clear on a human rights approach to talking and dealing and doing policy making around climate change. So our first uh, goal of our five points from our position paper was about distinctly recognizing us and our rights as indigenous peoples. And it proved to be very necessary when we came to the COP and saw the drafts uh, agreements. There was a lot of conflation of local communities and indigenous peoples, which is one thing that we see as necessary to separate because local communities is not a distinct legal group or, or has any distinct status. Uh, and the point here is that we as indigenous peoples are recognized as peoples with collective and individual rights. And everybody knows what we say when we say indigenous peoples, whereas a local community can be anyone. So all of these conflations of local communities and indigenous peoples, we were fighting very hard, especially the last week of the COP, uh, since we had a consensus in the Global Indigenous Caucus to push for the removal of these conflations. Also because some parts of the world governments are actually, um, you know, uh, not recognizing their indigenous peoples and conflating them with local communities and local communities can be anyone who have power. Uh, so so failing to 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 end this conflation is a direct uh, risk to the peoples in mind, the indigenous peoples. So we did get uh, a lot of uh, influence on on removing uh, and between local communities and indigenous peoples in the texts that came out of the COP28, which we were happy about because if we continue to, to have the conflation, it does not only affect us in the Arctic, but a lot of indigenous peoples are across um, the globe. Our second goal was also to have an equ equitable and ethical engagement of Inuit and indigenous peoples in general in Arctic, uh, or not just Arctic, but global climate change policy making. Uh, and we actually saw one reference to e e ethical and equitable engagement, which we then, you know, consider as something uh, coming out of our documents and also uh, the, the Inuit Circumpolar Council ethical and equitable engagement protocols that have been quite well received across uh, the indigenous world as a good uh, guiding principle to how to engage with indigenous peoples. And then we also had um, a, a goal to ensure that the combat of climate change does not infringe on our rights. This is also related to the just transition issue, because we do see that uh, efforts to combat climate change, be it green transition or other efforts actually are done uh, at the cost of the rights of indigenous peoples. And that balance has to be uh, found by anyone who is engaged in the very important task of combating climate change. Uh, we also, as I spoke about, where our fifth, fourth point was about equitable and direct access to the to the finance mechanisms, and and fifth uh, point was to recognize less as um, Vicky also talked about the link between climate change and other environmental threats, uh, because for us again it's all interconnected and we cannot separate. Um, the work on biodiversity or the work on marine governance, which are all big issues for the Inuit Circumpolar Council as well, from uh, climate change as a policy area. Uh, so for us, it's all uh, it's so important that the efforts are actually uh, interconnected. And here at some of the debates, uh, I highlighted that the UN unfortunately still is too much divided into silos. And what what is being done on the climate change framework does not necessarily resonate within the, the biodiversity framework and especially the issue of having a human rights approach and distinctly recognizing indigenous peoples is something that we have to be there every time and and fight for on or if we don't it's not going to be in the text um so i think that we had a, a strong delegation this year but also other indigenous peoples were there as well and uh, and had their strong delegations and as always the global indigenous peoples caucus under the frameworks that is established by indigenous peoples came together and uh, standing side by side, we were able to have some influence on, on the outcome documents uh, on, on the issues of rights anyway. Wow, wow. incredible, Sarah. Thank you so much. Gosh, you covered a lot. And um, thank you for bringing those um, really clear examples of how uh, Inuit people in the Arctic are experiencing climate change. Uh, that's, yeah, just, it's very sobering but also inspiring to see how uh, organized you were. And it sounds like you um, made some inroads <laughs> despite this really, um, the silos and the 
and the um, lack of understanding of connections between the biodiversity framework and the um, climate change framework. And I'm glad you brought up something and maybe we can get into it in the Q&A area, but your concern about the so-called green transition and in the rush to um, embrace renewable energy and, and moving away from fossil fuels, which is fantastic, uh, there are new challenges arising. For example, uh, the developing of mining um, resources or minerals that are, are rare earths or special resources needed to support the technology in the green transition, batteries and so forth. Um, those efforts are now threatening areas of important um, subsistence use for indigenous peoples, also very important biodiversity areas. Um, we see that in Alaska where I live. And um, so that's that's a whole other uh, basket of challenges <laughs> coming at us. But um, why don't we go on next to, uh, speaking of biodiversity, thank you, Sarah. Uh, we're gonna go on next to um, Dr. Martin Summercorn, head of conservation with the Global Arctic Program. And Martin, I have a, a bit of a long question, so forgive me for reading it, but um, we, we've just been talking about the climate change and, and biodiversity crises and how they're in, inextricably linked. Um, David Abeff and, and you personally have been um, a leader in identifying approaches that could help nature and people be more resilient to these um, impacts. Could you talk about the, the conditions for the success of these approaches and um, how might the outcomes of the COP help in moving these approaches forward? And I assume you'll summarize some of these approaches um, mm. just to give us yeah. some concrete examples. Well, that's a tall order, yeah, but I'll, I can try <laughs> to give it a start. Um, thanks, Margaret. Um, I, I think I would like to preamble what I'm going to say with with uh, with two things here. Um, the first one is we should be appreciative of the overall process of the UNFCCC. I was very pointed in my in my opening, but I would say what we are what we're doing here is nothing short of actually precedenting global governance on one of the most complicated issues that we have climate change it penetrates society it penetrates societies in different ways and we are we only have one atmosphere and we have to actually work together on the basis of nation state uh, setup of governance uh, globally to to pursue this and to uh, actually to to achieve this so that's that's an an incredible thing and it is it get going incredibly slow but the eventual framework um, is probably going to be very good. Um, the problem is, and that's my second point, um, we can't negotiate the melting point of ice. And we are running out of time. And we have lots of, uh, we see clearer now how actually the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis and the food crisis and the rights crisis are linked. And that's a hopeful piece. We can actually try over the process of creating global governance on climate change also actually propel forward some of these critical issues and come and, and basically jumpstart them and, and leapfrogging them to, to a, a better status. So I just wanted to say that up front because it is important to note what we are doing here, uh, even though we and also I will sound quite negative to some of the outcomes of this particular call. A particularly rec prerequisite, therefore, because it is we, that we cannot, cannot, uh, argue with the melting point of ice is that success on limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees and going eventually back to even lower warming is a prerequisite of succeeding uh, with conservation in the Arctic and also with what that nature means to people and the benefit it gave to people and actually giving them the benefit to, um, to, to, uh, to rely on nature going forward. And as Vicky has said, there was a one word mentioning of the cryosphere, so everything that is frozen on this planet. And it is actually an old one. It, it comes from COP26 already, and it says, notes the importance of ensuring the integrity of all ecosystems, including the cryosphere. Um, and, and that's basically sets the preamble of the, of the text uh, of this declaration. It also underscores that the impact of climate change will be much lower at the temperature increase of 1.5 compared with higher temperature levels and resolves over the global stock take the efforts to pursue uh, 1.5. However, the rest of the document really fails the integrity of the cryosphere as it 
really lacks the necessary sharpness to live to deliver to that 1.5 target, um, which is also illustrated by that the um, that there are only two paragraphs of a total of 196 ones that operationalize the 1.5 target in line with available science. And the available science actually tells us that that you can't negotiate with the global with the with the uh, melting point of ice, and that we will at two degrees most likely see the um, demise of the Arctic multi-year sea ice system. So we won't have or oh, in only very few years summer ice uh, in the in the Arctic. That we will most likely see the eventual collapse of the Greenland ice sheet, delivering centuries and millennia of sea level rise to the world, and the disintegration of huge swaths of Arctic near surface permafrost landscapes. All that is now after this, after this COP becoming a really likely, um, um, it becomes more likely than ever. Um, and that also means that our very good efforts to, to conserve and protect biodiversity for and for people and with people in the Arctic might not work if we, um, if we fail to limit uh, temperature rise uh, to 1.5 degrees. It is not that the declaration doesn't um, see that. It clearly, cl uh, it clearly quotes IPCC insight and and also insight of from from synthesis report that um, it notes with significant concerns that despite progress, glo green, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions are not in line with Paris. It, it states that um, the implementation of the current nationally determined contribution, contributions would reduce emissions on average by 2% compared to 2019 levels by 2030, whereas, and the declaration quotes that, IPCC has delivered that it would be have to cut by 43% by 2030 compared to 2019 in order to limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century, and that we have to peak before or latest in 2025 with global emissions in order to have a chance in hell to be with to limit global warming to 1.5. So there is little precious little in these um in this declaration that that allows that chance there is a kind of almost helpless a plea to parties to come forward in their next uh nationally determined contributions with ambitious uh, uh plea uh, contributions that align with the science and align with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. As we all know, the, the countries are now expected to prepare new nationally determined contributions and submit them before November 2025. And that to me is the litmus test on not only this COP28 um, outcome document, uh, but also uh, to, of the whole UNFCCC itself, in my, in my opinion. So, um, does that all provide now significant hope for the Arctic or is it just a continuation of kicking the can down the road? Well, I think we better align, uh, we, we better brace ourselves for, for, for impacts as the UNFCCC process continues and push for those new NDCs. One particular item, I just want to go into a second point here that, that though creates hope and that was really leapfrogged by the UNFCCC and not by the by the Convention on Biological Diversity, Diversity is um, the um, strong emphasis on nature-based solutions in order to empower people to um, address societal issues through um, and with the help of nature. And that is both acknowledged in the global stock take section of the, of the declaration. Uh, it notes the importance of conserving, protecting, and restoring nature and ecosystems towards achieving the Paris Agreement. And also in the adaptation part of, of this decision, uh, which clearly states that, um, that uh, the impact of climate change can be reduced uh, including through the management, enhancement, restoration, and conservation protection of all ecosystems on the planet. So these um, nature-based solutions um, are offering a much wider and more engaged uh, um, umbrella framework uh, to, to, uh, to um, 
address major societal changes with the, with the help of nature. And we have seen this uh, coming through the recent declarations of the UNFCCC. And I'm very hopeful that we can therefore um, build on these, um, including rights-based approaches, including uh, approaches that that work with the principle of free, prior, and informed consent of indigenous peoples and, and empower um, those who are actually affected to provide solutions that they know will work for them. So if I would finish on a, on a, on a positive note, it is this one, that the, the propelling forward of nature-based solutions really uh, was done under the umbrella of climate change and, and received another boost here um, at the UNFCCC COP28. Thank you, Martin. I think we. Uh, I might go around before we close and ask ask people for uh, any nuggets of of, of other uh, other nuggets of hope. But um, before we go on to Dr. Sue Natali, uh, just for our audience, could you um, summarize what uh, nature based solutions mean? It's one of the um, I think terms that is 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 now quite widely used in the conservation community. But for some of our audience members, um, nature-based solutions might not be completely clear. So maybe a couple of quick examples, but but brief if you could. You're asking me again or Sue? Yes. Sorry, I, I missed yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, Martin, if you could define what is a nature-based solution. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I think the, the <laughs> because they are um, defined as um, actions to protect, conserve, restore and sustainably manage and use natural ecosystems or and modified ecosystems uh, in order to address social, economic and environmental challenges. Um, they can actually and should be defined by those people on the ground, uh, by those societies, by those communities who are looking to, to establish these, these solutions. So it can be, for example, that in some settings, um, networks of protected and conserved areas uh, or individual um, indigenous-led uh, protected and conserved areas uh, or use areas provide, for example, nature-based solutions for food security. It can be that in a coastal environment, um, mangroves, for example, that's not a very Arctic example, but it's a good example, um, mangroves provide much more dynamic and better and integrated uh, solutions than coastal seawalls to um, the, the, uh, the, the consequences of, of sea level rise, um, because they also provide um, food security, engagement, uh, sorry, employment, and other, and other economic benefits. So these are solutions that are tailored to the very environment where, um, rest, where conservation is an, an, an equal footing with societal benefits. And, and both are necessary parts of these solutions. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay, uh, now, uh, Sue, I wanted to ask you, uh, as an expert who has been studying one of the, uh, I think, hidden threats to climate change or uh, hidden factors in climate change is permafrost and the thawing of permafrost, which is occurring across, uh, across the Arctic. Could you remind us, uh, our listeners, why understanding why and how uh, understanding permafrost is so critical? Uh, why is it important for the planet? And why must policymakers understand the importance of permafrost? And then what sort of outcomes do you think um, are relevant for permafrost coming out of the, the COP? All right, so I guess as the lead into permafrost, I just wanna come back to this mention of the cryosphere um, and, um, I, I, it's almost, I will say, we may have even taken a step back because at least last year, cryosphere was mentioned twice and um, cryosphere impacts or tipping points or feedback was also mentioned. And so leading into permafrost then, um, one of the, one of the, couple of major issues with the North is one, the rapid rate of warming, the rapid rate of impacts that have been happening in, uh, for decades and impacting um, indigenous peoples of the North, um, but also the global implications of the changes that are happening, both in terms of uh, loss of ice on land, loss of sea ice, um, and then loss of permafrost. And so permafrost is perennially frozen ground 
Um, it underlies much of the north, northern area, and it's important globally because it stores a lot of carbon, about 1.5 trillion tons of carbon is in permafrost, and some of that carbon will be released or is being released as permafrost thaws. Um, a major challenge, a couple major challenges of greenhouse gas emissions from thawing permafrost is one, you can't see it. It's really hard to measure. It's really hard to model. Um, and so we have this potential for what essentially might be, you know, at the magnitude of another greenhouse gas emitting nation it's in terms of greenhouse gas emissions um, it's it's not fully incorporated into say the IPCC report so the last report a couple of the models included permafrost but you know only two I think of the 11 had permafrost in, uh, at all right and so many of the models aren't even think incorporating permafrost and then the ones that did are missing some major processes like the sort of accelerated thawing and accelerated greenhouse gas emissions when you get this ground collapse, when there's ice in the ground, the ground collapses, causing very serious impacts um, for people and wildlife and, and, and plants of the north, but also it can make uh, greenhouse gases um, in the ground thawing happen a lot faster. And so that wasn't incorporated. And so um, these are some 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 issues with permafrost and why its relevance for the COP. And so when we talk about um, how do we stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius, permafrost may use up, you know, 20, 25% of the carbon budgets. And those are estimates to avoid 1.5 C, right? So we're uh, odds are, right, we're going to go over and then come back down. And so it may be even, uh, maybe even more of that. And, and then, I mean, another issue with permafrost is that we're thinking, you know, it's really an intergenerational justice issue, because why we may, you know, hit 1.5 C and come back down, people are being severely impacted now. But we also have this like long term kind of like inertia, right, of this earth system where we're going to be having emissions that will be coming out, you know, you can't just like shut the lights off and then permafrost refreezes and then we're back you know, everything's back to where we were and life is good again. And so I think there's a number of issues. And I and I just want to say one thing, because I feel like it's like all like bad news. Um, it is, a I guess, the, the couple maybe good things to know is one is we re reduce fossil fuel emissions elsewhere. Um, you know, these are globally mixed. And so reducing fossil fuel emissions can protect permafrost. Right. And that's important to people of the north, important to people everywhere. Um, but then the other thing is, you know, you got to know where you're where you're heading if you want to make smart decisions or sound decisions about how to how to protect people. What are the steps that we need to take? How to have a more you know fair and just equitable future. And so if you don't know where you're going, even though it might be bad news, you're better off knowing than than being ignorant and sort of having this additionality um, fall into your lap. And so um, I, I can't remember the other parts of the question, but that's sort of why why permafrost is important to this conversation. Okay, well, that's great. It was mostly, um, I think you, you've also answered it. Um, the, the other part of the question was um, how permafrost fared during, during the COP. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, I feel like we covered that quite a bit. Yes. Um, so thank you. Thank you, all of you. And um, this has been um, sobering, a few nuggets of optimism, and um, was clearly a lot of work cut out for uh, those of us in the policy world, in the conservation community, and pretty much um, <laughs> any community you're part of, I think, um, needs to take action on climate change. And that's just my personal pitch. Um, there is, uh, I think I'd like to go into a question. And uh, we had an interesting question um, already. Uh, and that is for Martin, but for anybody and um, who wants to chime in is that um, given that we are on a course to exceed the 1.5 degree warming target, uh, possibly very by a very wide margin, is there a role for geoengineering or other climate intervent interventions to avert catastrophe in the Arctic? This is a very um, challenging topic, I know, but um, would any any of you like to, to take on? And, and Martin, Briefly, uh, for the audience, describe what what is geoengineering anyway when it comes to the Arctic, yeah. and then is there a role for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't actually describe geoengineering, but I I, I would go into a, some of the the the, the so called interventions that are being discussed, um, and I think interventions for some of that what I want to talk about is probably not the right word. Um, the first thing I would say is that. Um, 
if we are talking about other approaches than mitigation, we have to mention uh, at a minimum carbon dioxide removal that can be done in various ways. Uh, it can be done at the source. It can be done like pumping it from the atmosphere. And it is noted, and we should all be aware of that in the latter part of this century, um, well, it should be noted that these technologies are not proven. Um, we don't know how cost effective they are. We don't know yet how they function. There are a couple of pilot projects for some of this, um, but they have actually not yielded the results at scale that they they um, that they were supposed to be. So we are still um, not sure these work. However, they are already part, explicit part of all 1.5 conform trajectories. Uh, of the IPCC in the second part of the century in order to limit global warming. So we actually are relying on these implicitly if we are asking for a 1.5 world. That's important to note. So we actually should look into these CDR, carbon dioxide removal techniques anyway, and we are doing so. Now, the second one that are the second big uh, group of things that are called interventions increasingly is solar radiation management. And that would be basically one of the ways of uh, increasing the reflectiveness of the atmosphere by seeding it with some sort of particles or cr creating some sort of, of particles that reflect the sunlight. Now, what we have done here is 28 years to come up with a global governance system for, for tackling climate change. I always say as a first thing, these, these so-called interventions lack a complete lack a global governance mechanism, and it will take a long time to actually come up with one that is just, because these are going to be very complicated, quite dangerous. Uh, in their effects uh, uh, interventions that are not being that are hard to control um, in terms of where the effects appear uh, and what happens if somebody does it just like that or stops it just like that. And the IPCC has actually alluded to that quite a bit. So, so these are kind of pipe dreams in my in my mind. Just because of the global governance, they also take away. Um, and that's a significant, especially for the polar region and especially for the Arctic Ocean, the fact that we have to deal with ocean acidification and its impacts on the food chain, and uh, including humans, and which is only and exclusively caused by atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Um, and these have to actually be reduced in order to control that acidification in the ocean. Um, uh, uh, so that really and other, I, I will stop here, um, uh, uh, effects of, of such interventions are really not desirable. Okay, again, um, helpful and uh, very thorough and also quite sobering to think about these technologies and uh, the, the urgency. Um, I would like to, I'm going to uh, read a question that we got from the, oh, and then I'm going to go to Sarah, would you like to respond to that? And then I'm going to go to a question and invite uh, another commentator that we have in the wings. But Sarah, over to you. To yes, respond. thank you. I just wanted to to, men to comment on the geoengineering uh, issue because it's, um, so it's also an issue that is uh, affecting us as indigenous peoples as more and more uh, researchers and, and, and project groups are uh, approaching us to, to obtain our uh, approval or support for geoengineering projects. And um, I think that in that development, one concern that we have is that we see an increasing interest in using our homelands as a testing ground uh, for different geoengineering projects. And some projects have already been going on with uh, effects on our uh, climate and nature uh, so here again, it is so important that any uh, any solutions that are sought for or any initiatives that are developed are done uh, in full uh, implementation and respect of the indigenous peoples in on that uh, land or who owns that sea or land or have traditionally occupied and owned that sea and land. And here we are 
miles away from governance structures, even in the Nordic and Arctic states that fully take into account the free prior informed consent of indigenous peoples, which is also part of the UN definition of nature-based solutions, for example. So we, we really, really, as I said at the COP, uh, I think we are not only at a climate tipping point, but also at a human rights tipping point, because so big efforts and pressure is on the world, including indigenous peoples, to act in a so-called name of a greater good. And if we are not careful, that greater good might violate our rights. So uh, in also just in, in answering one of the other questions about being leaders in the Arctic, I think we should exactly see uh, indigenous peoples of the Arctic as being leaders in terms of making sure that things are happening in an, in an ethical and equitable manner. Uh, that takes into account the rights of indigenous peoples, because we have been the clear voice advocating for the rights of indigenous peoples, not only of our own, but for the world's indigenous peoples. And I see a lot of uh, challenges ahead, both in terms of talking of nature-based solutions and being clear on what that is, and also geoengineering projects, because we see that some, uh, you know, this, this kind of a, a feeling of these things can be done in the name of a greater good that doesn't necessarily take into the account the, 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 the small number of people who live in a specific area. Because we are few, we are, we are only 56,000 in Greenland, but our rights are not less worth than other people's rights. And that's exactly the point with indigenous people's rights that we are recognized e as equal to all other peoples. And this also leads me to the comment of uh, leadership in the sense that reports have also shown that although indigenous peoples make up less than 5% of the world's population, we live and inhabit and occupy lands and seas on which 80% of the world's biodiversity is. So some things we are doing correctly as indigenous peoples, and we should look to those solutions uh, first and foremost. And that's also what we do, for example, as Martin mentioned, we are uh, pushing for indigenous-led, Inuit-led conservation um, initiatives and making sure that the efforts that are done in our homelands and seas is led by ourselves so that we uphold our right of self-determination in doing so. So I just wanted to comment that as well, Rihanna. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And there are yeah, some incredible and inspiring examples of uh, Inuit leadership around the Arctic on um, such solutions, including creating new protected areas and, and among many other things. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. And um, so I'd like to uh, share a question that came in from the audience. And I'm going to invite uh, Jan Dusik, who is the head of governance uh, uh, for World Wildlife Fund's Global Arctic Program. And um, the question, it comes from a student here at the Kennedy School. It says, when we at the um, Kennedy School Arctic Initiative were working on financing and, in, and in the financing and investment case for the Arctic in 2018, it was enormously hard to find traction with banks and institutional investors. Has the COP, has this recent COP created a better context to attract investment in sustainable development in the region? Jan, over to you. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Margaret, and exciting to uh, listen to the conversation. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, this COP uh, has brought uh, uh, a mixed bag of uh, of uh, resolutions. And uh, I would add one uh, nugget, as you called it, uh, on the positive side, which is that it's not just what the governments were able to agree, but what kind of signals uh, it sends, and in particular, what what signals it sends to the businesses and what it sends to the to the financial sector. And I think that's that's very important, uh, not just on the fossil fuel side, but also in terms of the, the boost in renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency and so forth. And I believe this is also a solution that uh, uh, that can be offered in, in relation to what can be the economies uh, in the Arctic for the future. And obviously there is still quite uh, quite heavy uh, oil and gas production in many parts of the Arctic, uh, which we which we cannot see for much longer, and we don't want this uh, to expand. And we need to look at solutions which will respect the equity, which will uh, which will uh, follow the just transition pathways as as much as this is happening in other parts of the world. This is how it needs to happen uh, in the Arctic as well, reflecting the rights of the indigenous peoples, uh, uh, and uh, and really. Uh, building on on the on the just uh, transition, the next COP COP twenty nine will be about uh, finance uh, uh, very much, and I think that's an opportunity to look into this deeper and to see how we can how how we can move that part of the equation that was uh, somewhat silent in this uh, in this COP 
uh, which was focused on mitigation, to see what are the solutions, what are the tools, uh, the, uh, the the question about uh, the loss and damage funding uh, uh, in the Arctic uh, was raised. The other one is uh, about uh, the conservation and adaptation to climate change. These are all potentials for investment, which will need to be done, especially as we see the, the climate change progressing. And we, we have a chance to do it right and uh, to think through how, how, these, uh, how these tools or funds or whatever we call it will be developed. Okay, great. And Jan, did you want to elaborate anything more on the significance of the global stock take um, process and the signal that gave for uh, business and finance? Yes, uh, obviously it's a complicated intergovernmental process, uh, even though there is a, a big fair happening around. Uh, uh, ultimately, the governments need to agree on uh, on the common denominator. I would say that it was not the lowest common denominator, but uh, uh, there was uh, a fair degree of disappointment that it, it should have been more ambitious uh, and less ambiguous uh, uh, in the in the outcome language. But uh, it is uh, it is important uh, signal for uh, uh, many parts of the world uh, uh, the uh, the carbon trading schemes the uh, uh, the finance sector these are all uh, sectors which are closely looking at what happens at these cops uh, and uh, uh, even though uh, we see that uh, there is uh, there is unclear uh, sometimes wishy-washy language about when we will see the phase out of fossil fuels. We see that this is a one-way road, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, the economy sees it even more. So, in that context, uh, we can see a bit of optimism. Okay, excellent. And um, we uh, we still have a few more minutes until uh, one fifteen Eastern time, so fifteen minutes past the hour. I'm going to just plant a, a question for you all, but then I'm going to go to a question that came into the uh, to the chat. And the question is, uh, all of you are Arctic warriors and have been at this for a long time. I'm hoping you can share one uh, thing you'd like to share, um, a next step that you're thinking about from either you as an individual or your organization, and also um, any any little bits of hope. We've heard we've heard some certainly um, some hopeful uh news on this um but maybe uh, we could also end one on, on some of those ideas that you feel um that are that are positive coming out of the top but i'd like to go to a, an interesting question before we uh go to our closing remarks and that is um having to do with uh, current conflicts around the world so the question is uh, given the outbreak of armed conflicts in several regions and the uptick in heavy fossil fuel dependent military operations what will be the impact on stated climate goals, particularly in the Arctic? Will climate solutions take a back seat compared to global security goals in the Arctic? And I know it's a little bit out of, out of uh, your spheres of expertise, but um, I wonder if maybe it uh, came up in, do you know if it came up in the COP, how these um, military um, yeah, conflicts around the world, especially in the Middle East and in Ukraine, are um, potentially going to divert policymakers from thinking about the, the outcomes of COP or um, put more pressure in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions on our planet. Any thoughts about that? Anyone? Bit of a challenging question. I Jan. can make you start. Or... Oh, yeah, Sarah. Sarah yes. and then Jan. The conflicts around the world, especially the Russian invasion of Ukraine, has already deeply impacted uh, what we are capable of doing in the Arctic uh, with the pause and now the attempts of restarting the Arctic Council and the very important collaboration on science. Uh, if we are not successful in making sure that that is kept uh, across the Arctic, including with Russian scientists, we will lose a lot of uh, very important data and ability to work across the Arctic on these areas. And uh, we have members in, in Russia, and this has, of course, affected our uh, way of working with our Russian members. Uh, in the Inuit in, in Russia are only about 1,600 to 2,000 individuals. And since the end of the Cold War, they have been equal members of our organization and continue to be so. And I did note also that there were quite a lot of Russian indigenous peoples there at the COP, but not without challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that we are standing in front of a huge, uh, si uh, difficult situation, and we are already in the middle of it, of a very difficult situation. Uh, and when I'm asked what the biggest security threat to us as a people, as indigenous peoples of the Arctic and as Inuit is, I continue to reply that it's climate change. 
uh, and that we must make sure uh, in any way possible to, to have some kind of a collaboration across the Arctic, including making sure that we still have an Arctic Council to work from uh, with uh, the way of working established under the Arctic Council. But obviously the security dilemma is ongoing and uh, I think that the um, you can talk a lot about NATO memberships and, and, and Sweden and Finland and what that's going to do with to the Sami people in that area. For us as Inuit, it has already impacted us very much uh, with this new sort of um, frozen situation we have uh, in, in the situation in, in the Arctic in terms of governance uh, collaboration. And here uh, we think that we have to consider uh, the bottom-up, people-to-people, cross-border collaboration as essential to making sure that we still have some threads of collaboration into Russia, uh, to our own people, the Inuit, but also on the scientific area. So um, that's a message that we continue to convey uh, in, in any um, platform and, and here as well. Well, Thank you so much. I'm so glad you brought that up and the importance of uh, circumpolar collaboration even at this time um, and the importance of the Arctic Council. And Sue, if you just have a quick nugget uh, responding to this question, and then I'm going to ask you for your um, next steps and or any positive uh, thoughts going forward. Sue. Yeah, just to, yeah, thanks. Just to briefly, I guess, second and add to um, Sarah's comments, the um, data can right now cannot flow out of Russia, equipment um, cannot flow in. And so we've already are impacted by data. There already will be gaps if people can't replace equipment for measuring impacts of climate change, feedbacks from climate change. And so I would, um, there, I, I did hear conversations about the need for um, allowing uh, climate change research to continue amongst Arctic nations. Um, but I will say right now it's um, on the ground. It's, it's, challenging, if not uh, impossible. Um, and so, so much has been stopped and, and, I, and I agree, I mean, this is a priority and I don't wanna be disrespectful to the people who are impacted by um, wars and, and acts of aggression, but I, but I think uh, many, many people are impacted by climate and I would love to see um, continued conversations about how to, how to move things in this diplom science diplomacy forward. Absolutely. No, clearly there are huge humanitarian impacts of the war and uh, we all recognize that. And on top of the, on top of those are these um, unexpected challenges in dealing with a global crisis. So on to our closing remarks. We have four minutes left and we'll try to keep, keep to that uh, time. We still have over 100 people with us, which is great. We started off with over 200, I think over 200 or almost 200. Anyway, um, I, I know there are a lot of students on the on the call, and that's terrific. Now I'd like to, I'll, I'll start with Vicky. What are your um, take-home messages or any uh, any next steps or recommendations uh, that you'd like to hand, uh, hand off to the crowd? Um, next steps or, or recommendations. Let me say my, 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 let me reword that a little bit and say my biggest highlight, let's say. Yes, okay, less, great. It would nonetheless be the recognition of climate and nature and the synergies between those. Um, exactly as Sarah had said earlier, they are inextricable. Um, yet for years, we've been talking about two very separate things. Um, and we haven't actually been working around these ones together, right? But now we have these 2030 goals for the Paris Agreement, for the upper climate, we have the Kunming um, Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework goals towards 2030. We have the Sustainable Development Goals to 2030. I mean, all of these ones play into each other and affect each other so much. And I think it's really welcoming um, that we are starting to talk about these together and opening up for us to be able to see how we can work on them. Thank you so much. Okay, Sue, how about you? Um, next steps. Or, or, uh, or it could be a positive highlight uh, that you'd like to reflect on in 30 seconds or less. No, just kidding. <laughs> Something <Okay>. quick. <laughs> um, positive highlight. I will say it is pretty, as much as we said, there's all these limitations to the um, GST outcomes. Um, you know, this is consensus. This is a consensus and document and 
people, you know, NDC, they're voluntary and that's incredible, right? Like there's not many things that can move forward thinking about consensus, consensus and voluntary. Um, I think there are additional highlights, you know, there's the, the sort of the, the documentation pushing that forward, but I think there's also these kind of um, collaborations that form and these building collaborations. And so for me, partly next steps, partly highlights is just the building opportunities for scientists to be in the room with policymakers, to be in the room with indigenous knowledge holders, social justice experts, climate, you know, human rights experts. Um, and and this is this is increasing, and I think the scientific community is 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 growing into understanding the need for this and 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 putting ourselves out there a little bit. So to me that's that's a strength. Awesome. Sarah. button, unmute button. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, I think that the one good thing that I did, I think I didn't mention yet on, on achievement at, at achievements at this COP is also the recognition of the knowledge of indigenous peoples, including references to the, our worldviews and values in some of the texts. Of course, we would see, like to see more of that, um, but what needs to be done at the next COP and the next, uh, uh, you know, sessions or, or or steps taken on the on the climate finance is to recognize the non market recognize the non market losses and dam damages to cultures and peoples and identities and human rights and so on, and that's going to be something that we will push hard for in the years to come. And also to make sure that in all texts we have an, a full inclusion of the knowledge of indigenous peoples as equal to scientific uh, Western conventional knowledge. Uh, and, and so that our contributions on that can also be recognized. That's huge. Thank you so much. And Martin. Yeah, very quickly. And I, I'll, much of what I wanted to say has been said. So, I, But I'm, I'm going to reflect on something else. Uh, and that is, I've been with this for a long time. Um, I have also been a coordinating lead author for the IPCC for the Polar Regions chapter. Um, and people at that point asked me, how can you bear all this, this knowledge? How how I'd still stay in the in the, still stay motivated. Now I, I would like to actually tell the audience, especially with, with because you said there are many students out there as well, you know, every tenth of a degree counts, and that is also IPCC language. It there are is lots of talk for the right reasons on thresholds, uh, on step events, on cumulative impacts. But every effort of limiting by every part of society counts. Every 0.1 degrees that we avoid is actually a part of the Arctic saved. And I think we are actually, we are too slow for saving everything, but we are not too slow to save something. And I think we we, we should really therefore stick to, to this process and stay motivated as there is no alternative. And that's my that's my 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 final word here for today for myself. Excellent. Wow. Well, we have incredible knowledge and leadership on this call. I am so grateful to all of you that you were there, that you stuck it out, and that you've been sticking it out for these decades. Uh, really, really thank you for sharing your insights with us. And um, I know I certainly learned a lot, and I hope others did. I'm sure others did too. And there's a, a lot more we could have talked about, but um, this was fantastic. And again, thank you all for sharing your time and expertise. Take care and happy solstice. Solstice is just around the corner. So <laughs> best wishes to all. Thank you again.